how to love yourself. When you forgive and let go, not only does a huge weight drop off your shoulders, but the doorway to your own self-love opens. For many of you who have been working on loving yourselves, and for those of you who are just beginning, I'm going to explore some ways to help you learn how to love yourselves. I call it my 10 steps, and I have sent thousands of people this list over the years. Loving yourself is a wonderful adventure. It's like learning to fly. Imagine if we all had the power to fly at will. How exciting it would be. Let's begin to love ourselves right now. Many of us seem to suffer from a lack of self-esteem at one level or another. It's very difficult for us to love ourselves because we have all these so-called faults inside us that we feel make it impossible to love ourselves exactly as we are. Usually, we make loving ourselves conditional, and then, when we are involved in relationships, we make loving the other person conditional also. We've all heard that we really can't love someone else until we love ourselves. So now that we have seen the barriers we have set up for ourselves, how do we catapult to the next step? One, probably the most important key is to stop criticizing yourself. I've talked about criticism before. If we tell ourselves that we are okay, no matter what is going on, we can make changes in our lives easily. It is when we make ourselves bad that we have great difficulty. We all change, everyone. Every day is a new day, and we do things a little differently than we did the day before. Our ability to adapt and flow with the process of life is part of our power. Those who have come from dysfunctional homes often become super responsible and have gotten in the habit of judging themselves unmercifully. They have grown up with tension and anxiety. The message they get as children of dysfunctional homes is, there must be something wrong with me. Think for a moment about the words you use when scolding yourself. Some of the phrases people tell me are stupid, bad boy, bad girl, useless, careless, dumb, ugly, worthless, sloppy, dirty, etc. Are these the same words you use now when you're describing yourself? There is a tremendous need to build self-worth and value in ourselves because when we feel not good enough, we find ways to keep ourselves miserable. We create illness or pain in our bodies. We procrastinate about things that would benefit us. We mistreat our bodies with food, alcohol, and drugs. We are all insecure in some ways because we are human. Let us learn not to pretend that we are perfect. Having to be perfect only puts immense pressure on ourselves, and it prevents us from looking at areas of our lives that need healing. Instead, we could discover our creative distinctions, our individualities, and appreciate ourselves for the qualities that set us apart from others. Each one of us has a unique role to play on this earth, and when we are critical of ourselves, we obscure it. Two, we want to stop scaring ourselves. Many of us terrorize ourselves with frightful thoughts and make situations worse than they are. We take a small problem and make it into a big monster. It's a terrible way to live, always expecting the worst out of life. How many of you go to bed at night creating the worst possible scenario of a problem? That's like a little child who imagines monsters under the bed and then gets terrified. It's no wonder you can't sleep. As a child, you needed your parent to come and soothe you. Now, as an adult, you know you have the ability to soothe yourself. People who are ill do this a lot. Often they visualize the worst, or they are immediately planning their funerals. 
they may give their power to the media and see themselves as statistics. You may also do this in relationships. Someone doesn't call you and immediately you decide that you are totally unlovable and that you'll never have another relationship again. You feel abandoned and rejected. You do the same thing with your job. Someone makes a remark at work and you begin to think you're going to be fired. You build these paralyzing thoughts in your mind. Remember, these frightening thoughts are negative affirmations. If you find yourself habitually reviewing a negative thought or situation in your mind, find an image of something you really would like to replace it with. It could be a beautiful view, or a sunset, flowers, a sport, or anything you love. Use that image as your switch to image every time you find that you are scaring yourself. You could say to yourself, no, I'm not going to think about that anymore. I'm going to think about sunsets, or roses, or Paris, or yachts, or waterfalls, or whatever your image is. If you keep doing this, you will eventually break the habit. Again, it takes practice. Three, another way is to be gentle and kind and patient with yourself. I've heard, dear God, I pray for patience, and I want it right now. <laughs> but patience is a very powerful tool. Most of us suffer from the expectation of immediate gratification. We must have it now. We don't have the patience to wait for anything. We get irritable if we have to wait in lines or are stuck in traffic. We want all the answers and all the goodies right now. Too often, we make other people's lives miserable by our own impatience. But impatience is a resistance to learning. Impatience is resistance to learning. We want the answers without learning the lesson or doing the steps that are necessary for our growth. You could think of your mind as if it were a garden. To begin with, a garden is a patch of dirt. You may have a lot of brambles of self-hatred and rocks of despair, anger and worry. An old tree called fear needs pruning. Once you get some of these things out of the way and the soil is in good shape, you add some little seeds or plants of joy and prosperity. The sun shines down on it, and you water it and give it nutrients and loving attention. At first, not much seems to be happening, but you don't stop. You keep taking care of your garden. If you are patient, the garden will grow and blossom. The same with your mind. You select the thoughts that will be nurtured, and with patience they grow and contribute to creating the garden of experiences you want. We all make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes while you are learning. As I said, so many of you are cursed with perfectionism. You won't give yourself a chance to really learn anything new because if you don't do it perfectly in the first three minutes, you assume you are not good enough. Anything you're going to learn takes time. When you first begin doing something, it usually doesn't feel right. To show you what I mean, take a moment right now and clasp your hands together. There's no right or wrong way to do this. Clasp your hands and notice which thumb is on top. Now open your hands and then clasp your hands again with the other thumb on top. It probably feels strange, odd, maybe even wrong. Clasp them again the first way, then the second, and the first again and the second way, and hold it. How does it feel now? Not so odd, not so bad. You're getting used to it. Maybe you can even learn to do it both ways. It's the same thing when we are doing something a new way. It may feel different, and we immediately judge it. Yet with a little bit of practice, it can become normal and natural. We're not going to love ourselves totally in one day, but we can love ourselves a little bit more every day. Each day, we give ourselves a little bit more love, 
and in two or three months we will have come so much further in loving ourselves. So mistakes are your stepping stones. They are valuable because they're your teachers. Don't punish yourself for making a mistake. If you are willing to learn and grow from the mistake, then it serves as a step towards fulfillment in your life. Some of us have been working on ourselves for a very long time and wonder why we still have issues that come up for us. We need to keep reinforcing what we know, not resisting by throwing up our hands in the air and saying, what's the use? As we learn new ways, we need to be gentle and kind to ourselves. Remember the garden. When the negative weeds grow, pluck them out as quickly as you can. Number four. We must learn to be kind to our minds. Let's not hate ourselves for having negative thoughts. We can think of our thoughts as building us up rather than beating us up. We don't have to blame ourselves for negative experiences. We can learn from these experiences. Being kind to ourselves means we stop all blame, all guilt, all punishment, and all pain. Relaxation can help us as well. Relaxation is absolutely essential for tapping into the power within. Because if you are tense and frightened, you shut off your energy. It only takes a few minutes a day to allow the body and the mind to let go and relax. At any moment, you can take a few deep breaths, close your eyes, and release whatever tension you're carrying. As you exhale, become centered and say to yourself silently, I love you. All is well. You will notice how much calmer you feel. You are building messages that say you don't have to go through life tense and frightened all the time. Meditate on a daily basis. I also recommend quieting your mind and listening to your own inner wisdom. Our society has made meditation into something mysterious and difficult to achieve, and yet meditation is one of the oldest and simplest processes there is. All we need to do is get into a relaxed state and repeat silently to ourselves words like love or peace or anything meaningful to us. Om is an ancient sound that I often use at my workshops, and it seems to work very well. We could even repeat, I love myself, or I forgive myself, or I am forgiven, and then just listen for a while. Some people think that if they meditate, they have to stop their minds from thinking. We really can't stop the mind, but we can slow down our thoughts and then just let them flow through. Some people sit with a pad and pencil and write down their negative thoughts because they seem to dissipate more easily. If we can get to a state where we are watching our thoughts float by, oh, there's a fear thought and some anger. Now there's a love thought and now a disaster. There's an abandonment thought, a joy thought, and don't give these thoughts importance. Then we begin to use our tremendous power wisely. You can begin meditation anywhere and allow it to become a habit. Think of meditation as focusing on your higher power. You become connected with yourself and your inner wisdom. You can do it in whatever form you like. Some people go into a kind of meditation while they're jogging or walking. Again, don't make yourself wrong for doing it differently. I love to get on my knees in the garden and dig in the dirt. It's a great meditation for me. An excellent, easy-to-understand book on meditation is Minding the Body, Mending the Mind by Joan Borsenko. 
Visualize optimistic outcomes. Visualization is also very important, and there are many techniques you can use. Dr. Carl Symington, in his book, Getting Well Again, recommends a lot of visualization techniques for people with cancer, and they often yield excellent results. With visualization, you create a clear, positive image that enhances your affirmation. Many of you have written to me about the kinds of visualizations you do along with your affirmations. The important thing to remember about visualizations is that they must be compatible with the kind of person you are. Otherwise, your visualizations will not work. For instance, a woman with cancer pictured the good killer cells in her body attacking the cancer and killing it. At the end of the visualization, she doubted whether she had done it correctly and didn't feel that it was working for her. So I asked her, are you a killer person? And she answered, I personally don't feel good about creating a war in my body. So I suggested that she change her visualization to one that was a little more gentle. I think it's better to use images like the sun melting the sick cells or a magician transforming them with his magic wand. When I had my cancer, I used the visualization of cool, clear water washing the diseased cells out of my body. We need to do visualizations that are not so offensive to us on the subconscious level. Those of us who have family or friends who are sick do them an injustice by continually seeing them sick. Visualize them well. Send them good vibrations. However, remember that getting well is really up to them. There are many good audio tapes with guided visualizations and meditations that you can give them to help them through this process if they are open. If not, just send them love. Everyone can visualize describing your home, having a sexual fantasy, imagining what you would do to a person who hurt you are all visualizations. It's amazing what the mind can do. Number five. The next step is to praise yourself. Criticism breaks down the inner spirit and praise builds it up. Acknowledge your power, your God self. We are all expressions of the infinite intelligence. When you berate yourself, you belittle the power that created you. Begin with the little things. Tell yourself that you are wonderful. If you do it once and then stop, it doesn't work. Keep at it, even if it's one minute at a time. And believe me, it does get easier. The next time you do something new or different, or something you are just learning and you're not too adept at, be there for yourself. It was a big thrill the first time I spoke at the Church of Religious Science in New York. I remember it very well. It was a Friday noon meeting. People wrote questions and put them in a basket for me, the speaker. I brought the basket to the podium and answered the questions and did a small treatment after each one. After I finished, I walked away from the podium and said to myself, Louise, you were fantastic, considering this was the first time out. By the time you do this six times, you're going to be a pro. I didn't berate myself and say, oh, you forgot to say this or that. I didn't want to have the second time be something that would frighten me. If I beat myself up the first time, I would beat myself up the second time, and I would dread speaking in the end. And after a couple of hours, I thought of what I could change to improve. I never made myself wrong. I was very careful to praise myself and congratulate myself for being wonderful. And by the time I had conducted six meetings, I was a pro. I think we can apply this method in all areas of our lives. I continued speaking at the meetings for quite some time. It was wonderful training because it taught me how to think on my feet. Allow yourself to accept good, whether you think you deserve it or not. I've discussed how believing that we are not deserving is our unwillingness to accept good in our lives. It's what stops us from having what we want. 
How could we create anything good for ourselves if we think we don't deserve to have good? Think about the laws of deserving in your home. Did you feel good enough, smart enough, tall enough, pretty enough, whatever? And what do you have to live for? You know you are here for a reason, and it's not just to buy a new car every few years. What are you willing to do to fulfill yourself? Are you willing to do affirmations, visualizations, treatments? Are you willing to forgive? Are you willing to meditate? How much mental effort are you willing to exert to change your life and make it the life you want? Number six, loving yourself means supporting yourself. Reach out to friends and allow them to help you. You really are being strong when you ask for help when you need it. So many of you have learned to be so self-reliant and self-sufficient. You can't ask for help because your ego won't let you. Instead of trying to do it all yourself and then getting angry at yourself because you can't make it, Try asking for help next time. There are support groups in every city. There are 12-step programs for almost every problem. And in some areas, there are healing circles and church-affiliated organizations. If you can't find what you want, you can start your own group. It's not as scary as you might think. Gather together two or three friends who have the same issues that you have and set up a few guidelines to follow. Have a book to study or tapes to listen to. If you do it with love in your heart, your little group will grow. People will be attracted like a magnet. Don't worry if it starts to grow and your meeting space gets too small. The universe always provides. If you don't know what to do, write my office and we'll send you guidelines on how to conduct a little group. You really can be there for each other. I started the hayride in Los Angeles in 1985 with six men with AIDS in my living room. We didn't know what we were going to do about this intense crisis. I told them we weren't going to sit around playing Ain't It Awful because we already knew that. We did what we could on a positive level to support each other. We're still meeting today and we have about 200 people coming every Wednesday night to West Hollywood Park. It's an extraordinary group for people with AIDS, and everybody is welcome. People come from all over the world to see how this group functions and because they feel supported. It's not only me, it's the group. Everyone contributes to making it effective. We meditate and do visualizations, we network, and share information about alternative therapies and the latest medical methods. There are energy tables at one end of the room where people can lie down and others share healing energies by laying on hands or praying for them. We have signs of mind practitioners they can talk to. At the end, we sing and hug one another. We want people to go out feeling better than when they came in, and sometimes people receive a positive lift that lasts for several days. Support groups have become the new social form, and they are very effectual tools in this complex day and age. Many new thought churches, such as Unity and Religious Science, have ongoing weekly support groups. Many groups are listed in New Age magazines and newspapers. Networking is so important. It sparks you and gets you going. I suggest that people who have similar ideas share time with one another on a regular basis. When people work together on a common goal, they bring their pain, confusion, anger, or whatever, and come together, not to moan, but to find a way to go beyond, to rise above, and to grow up in a way. If you are very dedicated, very self-disciplined, and very spiritual, you can do a lot of work by yourself on yourself. When you are with a group of people doing the same thing, you can make quantum leaps because you learn from one another. Every single person in the group is a teacher. So if you have issues that need working on, I would suggest, if possible, that you get into a group of some sort where you can work them through. 
Number seven, love your negatives. They are all part of your creation, just as we are all part of God's creation. The intelligence that created us doesn't hate us because we make mistakes or get angry at our children. This intelligence knows that we are doing the best we can and loves all of its creation as we can love ours. You and I have all made negative choices, and if we keep punishing ourselves for them, it becomes a habit pattern, and we'll find it very tiresome to let them go and to move on to more positive choices. If you keep repeating, I hate my job, I hate my house, I hate my illness, I hate this relationship, I hate this, I hate that, very little new good can come into your life. No matter what negative situation you are in, it's there for a reason. Otherwise, you wouldn't have it in your life. Dr. John Harrison, the author of Love Your Disease, says that patients are never to be condemned for having multiple operations or illnesses. Actually, patients can congratulate themselves for finding a safe way to have their needs met. We want to understand that whatever issue or problem we have, we contributed to creating it in order to handle certain situations. Once we realize this, then we can find a positive way to fulfill our needs. Sometimes people with cancer or other so-called terminal illnesses have such a hard time saying no to an authoritative figure in their life that on an unconscious level they will create a major dis-ease to say no for them. I knew a woman who, when she realized the illness she was creating for herself was just to be able to refuse her father's demands, decided to begin to live for herself for once. She began to say no to him, and while it was difficult for her at first, as she continued to stand up for herself, she was delighted to find herself getting well. Whatever our negative patterns are, we can learn to fulfill those needs in more positive ways. That's why it's so important to ask yourself the question, what is the payoff from this experience? What am I getting that's positive? We don't like to answer that question. However, if we really look within and are honest with ourselves, we will find that answer. Perhaps your answer would be, it's the only time I get loving attention from my spouse. Once realized, you can begin to look for more positive ways to achieve this. Humor is another potent tool. It helps us release and lighten up during stressful experiences. At the hayride, we set time aside for jokes. Sometimes we have a guest speaker called the Laugh Lady. She has a contagious laugh and puts everyone on a laughter cycle. We can't always take ourselves too seriously, and laughter is very healing. I also recommend watching old comedies, such as those of Laurel and Hardy, when you're feeling low or down. When I did private counseling, I would do my best to get people to begin to laugh at their problems. When we can see our lives as a stage play, with soap opera and drama and comedy, we get a better perspective, and we are on the way to healing. Humor enables us to pull back from the experience and to see it in a larger perspective. Number eight, take care of your body. Think of your body as this marvelous house in which you live for a while. You would love your house and take care of it, wouldn't you? So watch what you put into your body. Drug and alcohol abuse is so prevalent because they are two of the most popular methods of escape. If you are into drugs, it doesn't mean that you are a bad person. It means you haven't found a more positive way of fulfilling your needs. Drugs beckon to us, come and play with me and we'll have a good time. And it's true, they can make you feel wonderful. However, they alter your reality so much, and although it isn't evident at first, you have to pay a terrible price in the end. After taking drugs for a while, your health deteriorates immensely and you feel awful most of the time. Drugs affect your immune system. 
which can lead to numerous physical ailments. Also, after repeated use, you develop an addiction, and you have to wonder what made you start taking drugs in the first place. Peer pressure may have compelled you to take them in the beginning, but continued and repeated use is another story. I have yet to meet anyone who really loves themselves and who is hooked on drugs. We use drugs and alcohol to escape our childhood feelings of not being good enough, and when they wear off, we feel worse than before. Then we usually have a load of guilt, too. We can know that it's safe to feel our feelings and acknowledge them. The feelings pass. They don't stay. Stuffing food into our bodies is another way to hide our love. We can't live without food because it fuels our bodies and helps to create new cells. Even though we may know the basics of good nutrition, often we still use food and diets to punish ourselves and to create obesity. We've become a nation of junk food addicts. We have been on what I call the Great American Diet for decades, filling ourselves with processed foods of every sort. We've allowed the food companies and their advertising gimmicks to influence our eating habits. Doctors aren't even taught nutrition in medical schools unless they take it as an extracurricular subject. Most of what we consider conventional medicine at the moment concentrates on drugs and surgery. So if we really want to learn about nutrition, it's an issue that we must take into our own hands. It's an act of loving ourselves to become aware of what we put into our mouths and how it makes us feel. If you eat lunch and an hour later you start feeling sleepy, you might ask yourself, what did I eat? You may have consumed something that isn't good for your body at that particular time. Start noticing what gives you energy and what depletes you and brings you down. You can do this by trial and error, or you could find a good nutritionist who can answer some of your questions. Remember that what's right for one person isn't necessarily right for another. Our bodies are different. A macrobiotic diet is wonderful for many people. So is Harvey and Marilyn Diamond's Fit for Life method. They are totally different concepts, and yet they both work. Every body is different from every other body, so we can't say that only one method works. You have to find out which way works best for you. Then find exercise that you enjoy, that is fun to do. Create a positive mental attitude about your exercise. Often you create obstacles in your bodies primarily as a result of what you absorb from other people. Again, you need to forgive yourself and stop putting anger and resentment into your body if you want to create changes. Combining affirmations with your exercise is a way to reprogram negative concepts about your body and its... <laughs>